Amen. So Acts chapter 5, keep your place there. We'll get there in a second. So we're going to finish up Good Habits this evening. So you're saying, what is the last sermon in the Good Habits series going to be? And then I'll just give it to you right away. The last sermon in the Good Habits series is going to be on the topic of honesty and being honest. And you say, oh, that's obvious, right? Now, here's why that we're going to preach about, I'm going to preach about honesty this evening. Honesty is a little bit different in my mind than a lot of other sins that we'll talk about. You're probably going to hear sermons about honesty several times throughout the year. You say, why? And because honesty is one of those things that is, is different in the sense that, you know, when we talk about drunkenness, for example, you know, you're either a drunk or you're not. You either drink or you don't. You know, we talk about fornication. You're either in fornication or you're not. When it comes to the subject of honesty, you know, I don't think that any of us are ever going to reach the point in our lives of 100% honesty, unfortunately. You know, what I'm trying to tell you this evening is you're all a bunch of liars. All right? I mean, I think we've all got problems with this part of our lives that, you know, there's a spectrum here. And we should make being honest and having an honest report a habit in our lives. And we should always be getting better and better and better at this. But to say that somebody is completely honest, and I'll show that to you this evening, to say that somebody's completely honest, I mean, I'd have to call you a liar at, at that point. If you say, I'm just completely honest. I've never, you know, I never lie. I never stretch the truth. I never, you know, whatever. I'll get into all the different details and you'll see what I'm talking about. But first, let's look at this story in Acts chapter 5. So we're talking about making honesty a habit in your life. How do we do that? Let's look at this story and see what God thinks about this idea of honesty. So in Acts chapter 5, first of all, let's go back a few verses to Acts chapter 4 and get some context about what is actually happening in the story at the beginning of Acts chapter 5. Look back at verse 34 of Acts chapter 4, where the Bible says this. It says, neither was there any among them that lacked Meaning, these were all the, you know, the new disciples, the new Christians. I mean, this was the explosion of the beginning of the Christian church. I mean, this was exciting times. You say, how exciting? Well, look at this. And see if you could even imagine this type of thing happening today. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here you had these people basically, I mean, you want to talk about getting sold out. That's what these people were doing. They literally were selling out for the Lord. They were selling their lands, their possessions, everything that they had, and they were just laying the money down at the apostles' feet. And it said there was none of the, the new Christians, the new disciples in this church that lacked because they had all these resources at their disposal. Okay, so people were literally selling out here. Okay, but something happens in Acts chapter 5 where we see um, a little twist in the story. And look, now this isn't communism, okay? And I'm going to explain that throughout, you know, the, uh, the next few verses here. But people were voluntarily giving up their goods and giving them to the church. That's different. If, if somebody gives a donation to the church, that's a little bit different than, hey, you know, give me a donation right now, buddy. You know, that, that it's completely different. Would you agree? It's completely not the same thing. So these people are voluntarily selling their land, selling their homes, and just giving the money voluntarily to the church. Okay? Look, that's somebody with the heart in the right place that does that. But look at verse number 1 of Acts chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira his wife sold a possession. So here we see more of the same happening. And kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it. That means privy to it meaning that it's done in secret amongst them. It's something done in secret and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? So you say what? Does Peter just, you know, he will not accept anything that is not everything that you own? No, that's not what happened here. Look at the next verse. 
Peter then says in verse number four, this is the trick right here. He says, whilst it remained, was it not thine own? He said, look, you, this is why it's not communism right here. Because he said, look, you didn't have to sell it. He's like, why, it's, it, you could do whatever you want with it. And all of you, other than you know, tithing, as the Bible says that you should, 10% of your earnings, look, whatever you have and whatever riches, you, that's yours. You do what you want with it. You know, the Bible says that that first 10% is the Lord's. Look, you do what you want with that too, but that's the Lord's. Amen. And the Bible says you'd be stealing that from the Lord. But that's not the point of the sermon. Peter says, it's yours. It was yours. You know, it was yours. You could do with it what you wanted. And even, look, even after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So look, Peter says, while it was yours, you could do whatever you want with it. It's like after you sold it, you could do whatever you want with it. But what happened was they came and they were trying to act like, you know, Barnabas. They were trying to, you know, be, you know, get the glory like Barnabas. They're like, oh yeah, we're just like him. You know, they're trying to get this glory saying, we sold everything and here it is. But they had really, you know, in privily amongst themselves, you know, they sold it for a million dollars or whatever. And, he, you know, hey, uh, Heidi, let's sell this for a million bucks and let's give the church, uh, let's give Pastor Jimenez 200000 and say we gave him everything. <laughs> That's what they did. Okay? That's what they did. And the Bible says that, look, you know, it's, it's very serious what happened here. They, did, they weren't in trouble for selling the land. They weren't in trouble for not giving it all. They were in trouble for lying about what they did. Okay, look at verse number 9. Or verse number 8, I'm sorry. And Peter say, answered unto her. Now, so, so basically, uh, verse 5, sorry. Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Look, God killed him. And great fear came on them that, all, that heard these things. You think? I mean, so great fear came upon I mean, somebody lied to Peter, you know, the pastor, and God killed them. And great fear came amongst, amongst the people. I, I bet. Look at verse 8. Now the wife comes in. Sapphira comes in. And Peter answered unto her, tell me. He gives her a chance. He gives her a chance to fess up and tell the truth. She doesn't know what's happened. He, he's kind of seeing if she's in on it. So he's like, you know... You know, he's asking the wife, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. So look, they were in trouble for lying to the Holy Ghost. They were in trouble for lying. So we know, so we know that lying is serious. And God took it personally here as, you know, Ananias and Sapphira lied to Peter. God took it as if they lied to him. So think about that when you're lying to a man or you're lying to, you know, whatever, you know, God takes it personally like you're lying to him. God took it personally. He killed him for it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 6. So we know that lying is serious. But the Bible says in other places that lying is serious, that God hates lying. So, I mean, this is nothing new. But we see an example of God actually carrying this feeling out here. How serious he takes it. I mean, look, lying is so common now that it might just seem like no big deal to people. I mean, I know that there's a lot of people, hopefully not in this church, but that operate that just lying, you know, is just not a big deal. It's just not a big deal. It's just something that you can do to get away with things. But look at Proverbs chapter 6. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he's, he that soweth discord among the brethren. So look, out of these seven things right here, there's two that have to do with lying. And you could even argue that he that soweth discord among the brethren, there's really three. So I mean, almost, I mean, 40% of the issues of you know, these things that God hates that are abominations to him have to do with not being honest with not being honest. Proverbs 12, look at verse 22. 
Or just look at the front of, uh, no, this isn't the front of your bulletin. But look at Proverbs 12, 22. The Bible says, lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. So look, lying, not telling the truth, not being honest, is an abomination to God. I mean, you know, God hates it. Okay? So, looking at Ananias and Sapphira, let's look at this story, and let's just look at a few reasons in this story. Let's, first, let's look at why people lie. Why do we lie? Why, do, why aren't we honest? I mean, you say, why, why wouldn't I just be honest? I mean, I'm just going to be honest for the rest of my life. That's what you say. But why do people have such a hard time with it? Why would people do what Ananias and Sapphira did? Well, the first thing, and I believe this applies directly to Ananias and Sapphira, and it's, it's, it's completely misses the mark every single time, but this is what they were doing. People lie to look better to others. People lie, like, it's stupid because liars are generally easily identified, people that are not being honest, and people that lie to elevate themselves are usually doing it to degrade what others are doing or what others have done. And I think that that's one of the reasons that God was so upset here was because the men that had done, like, just given everything, that had just had their heart in the right place and just given everything to the Lord, like, look, God doesn't care how much they gave. God doesn't care about, you know, how much they gave. It's that their heart was in the right place and that they gave everything is why God did that. And they were, they were trying to, you know, trump that. Because I bet what Ananias and Sapphira sold, I don't know this, this is my opinion, but I bet what they sold was probably more than what everyone gave before. Because they were just trying to outdo everyone, just be, you know, get that glory for themselves. So look, I mean, all these people had sold out, given their possessions to the church, and Ananias and Sapphira wanted that glory, but they still wanted to be rich at the same time. They're trying to grab that glory. So look, lying most of the time is for people to, you know, to bring glory on themselves, to elevate themselves. Or worse, there's a second reason, and this doesn't really to apply to Ananias and Sapphira. Well, I guess, I guess it applies when they didn't fess up. When Sapphira didn't fess up, when he said, did you really sell it for this much? And she didn't just tell the truth. People lie to get themselves out of trouble. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. People lie to get themselves out of trouble. And for the Christian, why don't you just turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and I'll just read for you Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, the Bible says, this is one of the Ten Commandments. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It says, hey, don't lie about somebody else. But people do this to get themselves out of trouble, to put blame on somebody else, to get somebody else maybe caught for something that they've done, or to push off you know, responsibility on something that they've done onto somebody else. So people generally, that's another reason, people lie to avoid punishment, to avoid consequences. But look, this is a big difference between the saved and the unsaved here. So, I mean, none of us, here's how stupid it is if a Christian, if a saved person would lie to avoid punishment. Look at, are you in Hebrews chapter 12? Look at verse number 5. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, it's talking about how God, your Father, if you're saved, is going to chastise you. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not, not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth, scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? The Bible here is saying that if you're a son of God, if you're born again, if you're a child of God, you're going to be chastened by God. He's like, you're going to be punished by God. He's like, if you endure chastening, if you're doing things that are wrong and you're getting punished for it, it's a sign that you're saved. It's a sign that you're saved. It's just your Heavenly Father punishing you for your sins, for what you're doing. So it's, despise not the chastening. Take it, take it as you should, and learn from it. Look at verse number 8. The worst thing would be if you weren't chastened by God, because that means that you're not even safe. Okay, look at verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. 
Shall we, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So why, why is this? Why are we getting chastened? So people lie, right? People lie to get out of punishment, to get out of trouble, to put blame on somebody else for something that they've done. Verse number 10. For verily, for a few days they chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Look, you are going to be chastened by God if you're saved. Amen. And look, it's for your own good. Right. It's for your own profit, the Bible says. So we can be, I mean, it's so, it's, so we go and we do something bad and God chastens us. It's for our own good. It's so we can partake in His holiness. It's so we can become more like Him. It's to form us, to shape us, to sharpen us. Amen. So we can be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But look, it's, I mean, translation, just to sum it up, it's so we can get right. Amen. That's why we're chastened by God. So the stupidity of a saved believer lying to get himself out of trouble, I mean, here's how dumb it is. You're not going to get yourself out of trouble. You're going to be chastened by God. And you're then going to get chastened for lying. You know, what are you doing? It doesn't make any sense for a saved believer to be lying to try to get themselves out of trouble. You're going to get hit twice. You're going to be chastened twice. So, they lie to simply cover the truth. Some people lie to cover the truth. So, look, some people lie to cover up things that they should be doing. You know, maybe they lie because they know they should be doing something, and they're not, and they lie about it. Other people maybe cover up things that they shouldn't be doing. So people, I mean, they cover up these things. I mean, people that cover up, you know, trying to cover up things that they are doing, here's your, you know, people that stretch the truth. Here's your exaggerators. You say, I've I don't lie. You ever exaggerate? That's lying. People that, the excuse makers, you ever make excuses? That, that's lying. I'm excuse making. I mean, that is lying. That's all it is. You know, people that, these people that they display this, this pattern that, that seems like you know, disobedience to their Christian life, but it's never their fault. It's always, oh, something happened or something, you know, they can't ever get anything done. They can't ever move forward. But there's always a reason. There's, there's always some mystical outside force that is stopping them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. These people are liars. That's, it's plain and simple. But they're special liars. These people are special liars because not only... Are they lying to cover up things that they should be doing? But these are the type of people that believe their own lies. Yeah. These are the type of people that are really good at lying to themselves. But it's lying all the same. It's lying all the same. Turn to Luke chapter 8. The problem is this. The problem for these people that are lying and not being honest to try to cover up things that they should be doing and these people that are super good, I mean, they're, they're, they're so good at it that they, they believe what they're saying. The problem is Luke chapter 8 and verse 16. That's the problem. The Bible says in Luke chapter 8 verse 17, I'm sorry, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Look, if you are, if you are a liar to yourself, everybody else knows about it. That's what the Bible's saying here. I mean, if you, I mean, you may become, you may become the, only type, the only person that doesn't know you're lying. As weird as that sounds, that, that can be true. Because it will be obvious to everybody else. So how do we fix it? How do we fix it? We say, we, we see Ananias and Sapphira. We see what they were trying to do. We see the consequences of what they were trying to do. You know, how you say, I want to be honest. I don't want to be a liar. I don't want to do this. Uh, you know, let's talk about living a habitual life of honesty. How to be truthful. Turn to Proverbs chapter 22. Because look, I mean, seriously, it, it's a decision. It's, it's that simple. It's a decision to be honest. It's a choice. It's a choice to say, no matter what, you know, I will be truthful. And, and is anyone, is anyone, like I said, is anyone 100% truthful? Look, 
I want to be 100% truthful, but I know that I'm not. You should want to be 100% truthful, but you're not. So we need to work to get this habit of being 100% truthful in our life. Look at Proverbs chapter 22. Because look, those that lie, the first point I want to make about you know, being truthful and having this habitual life of honesty is this. Those that lie to look better accomplish the opposite. That is the first thing. Look at Proverbs 22, it's the, uh, or it's on the front of your bulletin. Proverbs 22, 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Look, this is where, I mean, this is where the Bible is saying is that if you're honest, you will have a good name, and it's hard to have a good name. The Bible says it's so valuable, it's better than any kind of riches to have a good name. But look, it's hard to gain. It's, it's hard to gain a good name. It t look, it, it was, it, we're talking about trust here again, right? I mean, I, I hate to repeat myself when I talk about how you know, hard it is to gain someone's trust and how easy it is to lose it. I mean, I mean, I'm going to repeat that over and over and over again. I was driving with Brother Angel today, and I was just telling him these same rules over and over and over again. I was like, how many times have I repeated myself? He's like, a lot. And then I said it again, and again, and again, and again. Because the important things need to be repeated. Okay? He's actually a pretty good driver. I was actually surprised. I was considering today might be the last day that I was on earth. <laughs> but, I mean, praise God. I'm still here. So look, it takes a lot of work to gain someone's trust. But you know what it takes? You know what it takes to gain somebody's trust? It takes consistency over time. It takes a lot of time to gain somebody's trust. It's one of the reasons that I, I, I don't like starting new jobs, because I'm like, I have to start from zero with everybody. I have to gain people's trust. And I, I know no matter how awesome I am, I can't gain somebody's trust in one day. I can't gain somebody's trust in one week. It just takes consistency over time. It takes six months. It takes a year to gain somebody's trust. And you know what it takes to break it? One lie. You can work a whole year. Think about that. You work a whole year at a job. And, and one lie. And you're done. You're down at the bottom again. So look, it can, it can all be thrown away. It's, in, it's incredibly hard to get, easy to lose. You're like, it's not fair. Tough. That's the way it is. So look, live an honest life. Make a habit of living an honest Live a life above board. Because look, personally, person number two in our study tonight was lying to cover up things. He was lying to cover up, he or she was lying to cover up things that she was doing, or he was doing. But why are you doing things that you have to cover up? Look, if you're doing things in secret that you don't want anyone to know, it's going to lead to you lying. 100%. It's going to lead to dishonesty. And look, secrets are always bad. There's another thing that I always say. If you wouldn't want to, you know, people knowing where you're going, people knowing what you're doing, people knowing, you know, look, you shouldn't be doing it. Because you're going to end up being a liar. You're going to end up trying to cover it up. And look, just like Jesus said in Luke 8, he's like, everyone's going to know anyway. He's like, everyone's going to know that you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, and they're going to think you're a liar. Look, there is, there is nothing, there is nothing good about any of this. That's why it needs to be a habit. It just needs to be a habit just being just overtly honest in your life. So look, instead of covering up your life, here's the second thing, instead of covering up your secret life or your whatever life, change your life. That, I mean, that's the answer. You're like, that's, look, first of all, that's the answer to everything. Okay, change your life. Now, when I figure out how to actually get people to change, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. But here's the thing. All, I mean, what actually, because look, how to get people to change, I haven't quite figured that one out yet. I know what they need to change, but I don't know how to get them to actually change. But here's what needs to happen. If you can help me figure this one out. Here's what needs to happen to get people to change their life. Here's what needs to happen. People need to stop lying to themselves is what people need to do. That's the first step. Look, you need to stop convincing yourself that there's not a problem. I mean, think about this. When you, I mean, think about all the time you spend here. When you read the Bible, 
when you listen to preaching and you're sitting there saying, oh, that applies to me, or is that talking about me, or that could relate to this situation, or that could relate to, oh, yeah, that could be this. Yeah, it's, 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 it means you. It means you. But if you just quickly lie to yourself, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at that. And yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, some people are pretty good at just lying right away to themselves. Well, look, stop telling yourself it's somebody else's fault. Admit fault, fix the problems. It's the only way forward in your Christian life. I mean, it's the only way. Being honest and someone who's honest with himself will change your life. So if you can stop lying to yourself, it'll change your life. It'll humble you as a person, and it'll change, you know, and people will start to know you for this. People may not think you're the best person at everything, but they'll be like, yeah, that guy, he, he's a straight shooter. You know, he's honest. No matter, what, no matter what they can say about you, they'll know that you're honest. And, and you know what? If you're just, just brutally honest, like I'm not talking about being rude, but if you're just, just, just honest on everything that you do in your life, people will begin to trust you. You're like, I, I don't know, at, at work, people, they don't, they don't trust me, they don't give me responsibilities at church, at, at, wherever, I'm, at whatever I'm involved in, it doesn't seem like I'm, I'm getting more responsibilities or I'm getting more things to do or I'm getting more, you know, because people probably don't trust you. Why? Because you're not honest. It, it's, it's really that simple. It's really that simple. So, I mean, look, I mean, you have to make the decision to be honest. I mean, you, you, think it's, you think that's an easy statement, but the thing is, when people make a mistake, it's, it's like this first knee-jerk knee, knee reaction is to just cover up. When people make a mistake or they didn't do the right thing, the first thing they want to do is they want to they cover it up. And once you've done that, like once you made that first statement to try to cover something up, now you're in a lie. Now you're in a lie, you gotta back yourself out of, you know, and I mean, just some examples. You know, here's some things that you might, even, might not even think about as being dishonest. But here's the thing, excuses. Excuses are lies. I mean, excuses are lies. I mean, most of the time, excuses are lies. I mean, when you, when you don't get something done, or you, you didn't do something that you were supposed to do, and you just start making excuses, most of the time they're lies. And even if they're not lies, people probably think that they're lies. Because people, people are so, people make so many excuses today, it's ridiculous. I mean, think about it. I, I went, I'm supposed to be an ensample to you. So I went and I did an evaluation of my life in two areas here. here here's a simple one. Calling in sick to work. This is a simple one. So look, I'm, I'm so paranoid about this. I'm so paranoid because so many people do this dishonestly. I'm so paranoid. I was like, I was trying to think about like, when's the last time I called into sick? And I have called into sick to work. In 2010, when I got the swine flu, I took one day off a sick day. That's the only time I can think about taking a day off as a sick day. But I'm, I'm so paranoid about it because I know even then, I know that I'm calling in sick and I know that there's some people that are like, yeah, what's he really doing today? And I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be lumped into that. Now, I mean now, forget it. Calling in sick now is ridiculous. I mean, it's like it's tied to, it's tied to unemployment and all this stuff. People are calling in sick so they can get paid. People are calling in sick so they can get unemployment. I went and I did a check on how many times I've gone in unemployment in the last 25 years. I went back 25 years and I counted every single time that I went on unemployment. Zero! Never! Ever! Ever! Because look, people just, people are going to think you're a liar. People are going to think you're dishonest. They're going to think that you're just doing that because you don't want to work. It's the same thing with calling in sick. The last company in Sacramento that I, I, they hired me on, they're like, we're going to give you two weeks of sick pay. I'm like, that's a, can I take it for just normal vacation? And they're like, no. I'm like, it's a waste. I'll never use a day of it. What else you got? I mean, it's just, don't ever do it. Ever. Because, I mean, I mean now, I mean, if you have corona, I suppose you have to. But my, my point is, don't ever do it. Because you're just going to be lumped in with all these people that just use it as an excuse. Christians do it. It's pitiful. It's pitiful. Exaggerations. 
Exaggerations are lies. I mean, exaggeration, exaggerating everything is lying, except for like hunting and fishing. That doesn't count. And I've taught the boys that. I had to teach the kids that because like I'd be telling some hunting story. I'd be like, you should have seen this deer. You mean, <laughs> you know, and, and Garrett would be like, Dad, the deer was like this big. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> or you should have seen this fish. I mean, his head was as big. He almost ate Jacob. His head was the size of Jacob's whole body. And Jacob's like, Dad, the fish was only this big. I'm like, quiet, boy! I'm just kidding. Look, people that are constantly exaggerating things, I mean, it's the boy that cried wolf. If you're constantly exaggerating, exaggerating, people are just going to not even listen to you anymore. They're just going to think you're a liar. You know, they, it's, it's, they equate it to the same thing. So look, there's really two things that this honesty comes down to. There's two things. It's your, people lie and they're dishonest because they're worried. Look, you're going to damage, here's the damage that you can do in two areas. The damage is your reputation to others. That's the first thing. Everyone's going to think you're a liar and nobody's going to trust you. I mean, who wants to be in that spot? But that, that's what dishonesty will cost you to others. But that's not the main problem. That's not the biggest problem. And the biggest problem, the biggest problem with dishonesty, and the reason that it really deserves this sermon in the, in, you know, at the end of our habit series, is because dishonesty, when it comes to, you know, dishonesty is the one thing in your life that will actually stunt your Christian life. It will just stop it in its tracks. If you're, if you're dishonest to yourself, I, I think that's the worst thing. Because, I mean, if you're dishonest to yourself and you just lie to yourself and you never tell yourself you have any problems, nothing's ever your fault, you're constantly making excuses for yourself, you're going nowhere with your life. And you'll meet people, you'll meet people who do this their whole life. You meet people who are saved and that just, they just stunt their whole Christian life. And, and that they, you know, it costs them the whole thing. But look, I mean, we don't have, I mean, think about this, folks. We don't, we don't have a lot of time here. And we wouldn't have a lot of time on this earth. Our lives are like, like vapor, like spilled water. Our, our lives are nothing compared to the eternity that we're dealing with, that we're, that we're, that we're responsible for. You know, our lives are, it's just, we don't have a, a lot of time. So the best thing that you could do, I mean, if you don't even care about your reputation, you don't care about having a good name, at least don't, don't waste your whole life. Because being dishonest with yourself could cost you a, a, a life of, I mean, if you're just somebody who's just honest with himself and just takes everything from the Bible to heart, th those are the type of people that are just on this, this upward Christian life. Um, you know, they're, they're on a run. And you just see the growth. And you see the growth happening at, at you know, it's, it's great. These are the people that are growing in their Christian life. These are the people that are going to do great works. They're going to do great exploits for the Lord. And it's going to get better and better and better the more they grow. Because look, as you get more responsible and as you get more, you know, mature in the Christian life, you're just going to get more and more responsibilities. That's the way God works. But if you just stunt yourself here at the bottom, you, the person that you're most dishonest with is yourself. It doesn't even matter what other people think of you. You're just going nowhere in the Christian life. You're going to be flatlined. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the biggest thing. I want to see you all succeed. I want to succeed in this Christian life. I want to succeed in this life of mine that's half over. I, I, want, to, I want to do great things. I'm not done. Don't think that you're done. And look, start growing. Continue growing. But it takes, you know, do an assessment on yourself. Be honest with yourself. You know, where am I at? These are the people that grow. You know, these are the people, and look, I see it in this church. I see the people that, you know, they come up and after, after sermons that are preached on something, and, and Pastor was so right on this. Sermons that were preached on something, and people come up and they're just like, they're just like, man, that just hit me really hard, and I really got to work on that. I'm like, I, I had no idea. You know, writing the sermon, I, I didn't even, your, thought, your name didn't come into my mind even one time. But these are the type of people that apply the Bible to their life. And they're humble, and they're just, they're, just, they're just drinking it in and changing a, as they drink it in. Because they're, they're incredibly honest with themselves. So the person that you need to be honest with is you. 
and then everything else will work from there. You know, I mean, if you're, I mean, think about it. If you just decide, I'm never going to make excuses. You're like, I mess up a lot. Here's the thing. If, if you mess up a lot, and you're just like, I'm never going to make an excuse, that means you're going to have to go and like fess up to a bunch of stuff a lot of times, right? You're probably going to work on not messing up so much. Whereas, I mean, excuses become a crutch for people. They just keep messing up. They go, oh, it was Brother Angel. Ah, Brother so-and-so. Ah, whoever made me do it. You know, they use it as a crutch, and then they never get better. But look, if you're completely honest with yourself, you're going to get your act together. It's, it's, it's really that simple. And eventually, you're like, I'm going to be honest with myself. I'm going to get my act together. I'm going to change. I'm going to be completely honest. I'm going to make that a good habit in my life. People are going to start to trust you. They're going to start to trust you here. They're going to start to trust you at home. They're going to start to trust you at work. They're going to start to trust. I mean, look, your wife, I mean, if you're just constantly telling your wife, men, as leaders of your family, you're constantly telling your wife, oh, we're going to do this, and this is going to happen, and we're going to, this is the way I'm going to lead this and this and this, but nothing ever happens? I mean, it doesn't mean she's not being submissive, but she probably just doesn't have a lot of trust in the things that you say. So if you actually are honest and just like, hey, you know, I'm actually going to make these things happen, people are going to start to trust you. Your kids, your family, your wife, I mean, all these people, your boss. And then maybe you become the boss. And then, you know, people are just going to, I mean, great things are going to happen. You'll grow in your Christian life. So look, it's a good habit. And it's something that we always, all of us, need to be working on constantly. Especially the whole, you know, honesty to ourselves. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.